Amen. All right, the part of the chapter specifically that I want to focus on is going to be very, beginning right there in, in uh, the beginning of the chapter. 1 Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 1. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. The title of the sermon this morning is, How Long Wilt Thou Mourn? How Long Wilt Thou Mourn? I'm going to be dealing with the topic of moving on from hard things in life, or moving forward after something bad has happened to you, after maybe a tragic event, something something sad, or maybe even just something just horrific. I mean, I don't know what's going on in everyone's life. I don't know what each person has personally going on in their families, or just extended friends, or anything like that. But I know that life is not roses and rainbows like a lot of people try to portray it out to be. I know that life is very negative. And you know, there's this concept and this doctrine and this teaching that has even crept into Baptist churches that we should never talk about negative things. That we should ne- all we should talk about is positive. And if you just focus on the positive, that, this, is, this is actually what they, they think the ultimate outcome is going to be. If you just focus on the positive, all the negative just goes away. You just never worry about it. It doesn't work like that. You know, we're human beings and life is filled with negative things. It's packed full of one trial after a trial after a tribulation, just over and over and over again. But what I want to preach about, I want to equip you from the Bible to be able to get over hard things that happen in life. To get over sad events, you know, hard things, trials, tribulations, whatever it may be. Like I said, a family member passing away, you know, any type of event that would that would cause trouble in your life. You need to be able to look past those things and to get over those things. And here in 1 Samuel, can you just flip this thing off? I need to spend like 15 minutes figuring out how to control each gear on this fan or something. Because it never works. No, I was, I was saying over there because I don't think it's going to work here. When I do it, I've tried it before and it don't work. Brother Russell mentioned that to me once. I think it's faulty. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't care if it's a little bit darker up here. It's, uh, it's light enough out there. So in, in 1 Samuel chapter number 16... Verse number one, Rick looked up here like it looks weird now, I can tell. <laughs> First Samuel chapter number 16, <coughs> verse number one, notice what God says. This is coming out of the mouth of God. He makes the statement, how long wilt thou mourn? What is the implication? Is there a problem with mourning? No, there's not a problem with him mourning, but he's saying, how long wilt thou mourn? He's basically saying this, hey, hey Samuel, enough is enough. It's fine that you're mourning. It's fine that you were sad. But guess what? This is what he's saying. It's time to move on. It's time to go forward. It's time to forget about what happened. How long wilt thou mourn? Because you know what can happen? You can just fall into just a state of depression for the rest of your life. That's what could take place. That's why he tells him, how long wilt thou mourn? Turn over to Ecclesiastes (coughs) chapter number (coughs) 3. Excuse me, verse number (coughs) 1. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, verse number 1. <coughs> I want to make some preliminary statements before I really move into the topic of the sermon. I want to touch on the fact that there's nothing wrong with mourning. There's nothing wrong with being sad. You know, there are times to mourn. There are times to be sad. <coughs> you know, we look at the Lord Jesus Christ in his life. And he was sad throughout his life. There are different times. You know, it talks about him when he showed up to Jerusalem... You know, how he wept over Jerusalem. It talks about, you know, the, the, the shortest verse in the Bible that if you've ever memorized any of the Bible, I'm sure you have this verse memorized. Jesus wept. The Bible says Jesus wept. Jesus wept over Lazarus. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. I'm sure those are not the only two times, you know, that Jesus wept. I guarantee there were multiple times as an adult man when Jesus cried. I'm not telling you there is there is not a time to be sad. I'm not telling you that there's not a time to mourn. I'm not telling you that there's not a time to weep, to cry. Yes, that has to be true with that statement. How long will thou mourn? It's okay to mourn, but how long are you going to mourn? Are you just going to continue in that state? Now, I want to deal with this real quick because a lot of people say you should never just anything negative just should never be in your vocabulary. Don't think 
you know, the power of positive thinking. That's not true. There is a time to mourn. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, verse number 1. To everything there is a season and a time, to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, <coughs> a time to plant <coughs> and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a, ta a time to build up. <coughs> Watch what he said. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Now I wanted to finish that entire context there. Just because it really, it, it sets the stage with verse number one. It really tells you the purpose of why everything is being quoted here. That there's a time for everything. That's what he says in verse number one. To everything there is a season <clears throat> and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And he contrasts things that are opposite. He's saying, you know, there's a time to be happy and there's a time to be sad. And then when he talks about dancing, it's, it's, it's being joyful, right? It's what you do when you dance. You know, I don't go around dancing. And when I picture David dancing, when it talks about him dancing, he is, it's a celebratory dance. It's, that's why it uses the word dance here, because he's dancing as in being joyful. So it's talking about being happy. It's contrasting mourning with happiness. And notice... You know, it's not only, hey, there's a time for everything, there's a time to mourn, and then it just stops. No, there's a time to mourn, but guess what? There's a time to stop mourning is the point. There's a time to move past that. Yeah, there's a time to be happy. And you know what? Sometimes when you're happy, that's not the time to be happy. Sometimes when you're joyful, that's not the time to be happy. It's actually the time to be sad or to mourn. There is a time to mourn. You know, uh, in, in James... Uh, I, don't think, I don't think I included it, but in James chapter number 4, you know, uh, I can't remember the exact uh, verse, but in James chapter number 4, he talks about be afflicted and mourn. And, and then he says after that, let your laughter be turned into mourning. He's saying it's not the time to be happy right now. This is the time to be sad. But you know what? It's not always the time to be sad. It's not always the time to mourn. There's a time to move on from that. And when if you look at people's lives that have that have, have slipped into this type of just 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 perpetual state of depression, I bet it started with a tragic event in their life oftentimes. I bet it started with something happening, a parent dying, or you know, uh, something happening happening with a friend, or something happening in their life that just caused all this trouble, and then you know what happens? They get sad and then they just continue being sad. You know what someone needs to say with them to them? How long wilt thou mourn? How long is this going to go on? There's a time to move on from it. There's a time to mourn, but you know what? There's a time to be happy. There's, a, there's nothing wrong with being sad. And you know what? Right now might be the time for you to be sad. It might not be a time for you to be happy, but you know what? There will be a time for you to move on from that. And you need to just get over it is the point. And that's what the Bible teaches, that there's nothing wrong with being sad. There's nothing wrong with mourning. There's nothing wrong with weeping. But there's a time to move on from that. How long wilt thou mourn? Turn to John chapter number 16. <coughs> We're going to look at verse number 20. John chapter number 16, verse number 20. There's a specific event in which Jesus talks about this exact pattern of mourning, of sadness. And then immediately thereafter we'll see joy and happiness. <coughs> John chapter number 16, look at verse number 20. <clears throat> Jesus speaking, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament. Talking about like mourning. But the world shall rejoice. <clears throat> and ye shall be sorrowful. But your sorrow, watch this, shall be turned into joy. It's the exact opposite of what I, when I quoted James chapter 4. He said, let your laughter be turned into mourning. What does he say here? He says, let your sorrow, he's saying your sorrow shall be turned into joy. So you see that transition from mourning, from sadness. And what was God saying to, to Samuel? He's saying, stop being sad. You know, there's, it's not the time to be sad any longer. It's went on long enough. 
It's not, you need to move on from that. And right here, look at the context, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. He gives you a, an example. <clears throat> a woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered <coughs> of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye, and ye now, he's going to tell you exactly what he's likening this unto, just so you understand the context, just for educational purposes or informational purposes. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. So we see, you know, he's likening it unto his ministry, and that Jesus is going to be crucified. That's what he's talking about. And you're going to be sorrowful. You know, Jesus is going to be dead for three days, right? And we see a perfect example of this being played out in Luke 24, when Cleopas and the other man are on the road to Emmaus. They're walking, and what are they? They're sorrowful. And Jesus shows up to them, and what does he tell them? Why are you sad? That's basically his point. Why are you mourning? Doesn't the Bible teach that this is what's supposed to happen so that he can enter into his glory? So we see the sadness, we see the mourning, and then we see the happiness, the joy. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. There's going to be a time when you're not sad anymore, right? I want you to take uh, turn to Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. <coughs> Did he tell him, hey, when I'm crucified, don't even be sad. Don't even mourn. Did he say that? No. He didn't tell him that. He said, you're going to be sad. You're going to mourn. It's just natural. And it's a, it's this weird, that's a weird type of teaching for somebody to try to tell you you should never cry. You should never be sad. You should never mourn. That's not right. There's a time to mourn. And it's, and it's bad for you emotionally and mentally if you just like never show any sort of emotion ever. And you just think you need to bottle every little thing up and just act like this drone or this stinking robot where nothing affects me ever. Right. You know, there's nothing wrong with showing emotions. There's nothing wrong with mourning, being sad. I'm not saying every time you come in here, start crying. But I'm saying there's nothing wrong if something's going on when you talk to somebody. You know, you can be sad sometimes. You know, you know. Everybody's like, well, I'm too manly. You're not more manly than David. You're not more manly than Jesus. And God, God didn't think, hey, this is going to emasculate David when I write down in the Bible that he wept. God, Jesus is the author of the Bible, God himself, and he had no problem with putting that verse in there. Jesus wept. That didn't bother him. That didn't you know, take away from his manhood. That doesn't make you manly. Right. That actually makes you wimpy to me. When I see this person trying so hard to make themselves look masculine, I think you're trying to overcompensate for something. Maybe you're really not that manly. You know, a, a real man has no problem with showing his emotions. It has no problem with, hey, when I'm sad, I'm sad. But you know what? Don't always be sad. Then you really are girly. You just walk around sad all the time. You know, there's a time to mourn. Bad thing happen. Bad things happen, but you know when you're the test of whether you're a man or not? Can you get over it? Amen. Can you seek resolution and move on from that? Look at Hebrews chapter number 12, <coughs> verse number 11. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 11. <coughs> he says, Now no chastening <coughs> excuse me, for the present seemeth to be joyous. So he's saying when chastening goes on, when God is chastening us and punishing us, at that time it doesn't seem to be joyful. He's saying it's not joyful. That's just another way for saying it. It's not a joyful thing. It, it doesn't feel joyful to you. He says, but grievous. Nevertheless, after it yieldeth, <coughs> afterward it yieldeth, that means it brings about, right? The peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, <coughs> lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Now, I don't know if you notice this, but I'm going to exposit it, and this is a teaching all throughout the Bible, and I touched on this in Romans chapter number 5, that you are going to go through trials and tribulations. You are going to go through problems in your life. You're going to go through different things that hurt you and try you, Right? But the Bible over and over again talks about how those tribulations and those trials will make you stronger. And it actually is really a deciding factor in your life. It truly is. Because I want you to look at this passage real quick, and I'm going to show you that from this passage. So he says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Watch this. Unto them which are exercised thereby. So does it yield 
of the peaceable fruit of righteousness to everyone? No, it doesn't. Only unto them which are exercised thereby. Now keep reading. Watch. Wherefore, right? Therefore he's saying. Therefore he's saying so that, so that you can exercise yourself thereby. Therefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. He's saying when you're tired, when you're weak, your hands, that's a, a position that people are in. You know, their knees are bent because they're not standing up straight. Their hands are kind of just, you know, their arms are just waving around because they don't have the strength to stand up. He's saying this. That you have two choices. When you're being punished by God, when, when some trial or tribulation is going on in your life and you're being tried, you have two options. You have two ways that you can go. You can either choose right now to get over it, to keep moving forward and be exercised thereby, and you'll bring fruit, forth that peaceable fruit of righteousness. But what's the implication if you don't? Look what It doesn't imply it actually. Look at the next verse. And make straight paths for your feet. He's saying, stay on that same path. Watch this. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. What is healed referring to? Some sort of pain, some sort of anguish. In this context, it's God punishing someone, right? You don't know whether a trial or a tribulation is an indirect or direct punishment from God in the first place. But either way, it can apply to a situation when someone else persecutes you or does something to you. Or even if something bad happens in your life of a family member passing away. Whatever it may be that may make you mourn, right? But you have a choice. You can either lift up the weak hands, stand up the feeble knees, and continue and make straight paths for your feet. And be exercised thereby and bring forth that fruit of righteousness. Or you can let that which is lame, that which is injured, just continue being injured. Just continue being sad. Just continuing down that path, that other path, which would lead to just whatever it may be, a state of depression. A continual and perpetual state of depression. A backslidden state of a Christian. A person that just gives up on life. That has no zeal for God. That just comes in here and not even interested. It doesn't mean just because you're backslidden doesn't mean that you're not going to church. You can come to church every week, but not really enjoy it. There's plenty of people that go to independent Baptist churches all across the United States that have no interest in being there. They're going there because they were raised in that church their whole life. They go, they don't listen to the Bible, they're not growing. You know what? And, but there's some people that are in that same state as those people that maybe a trial or a tribulation hit them in their life, and then they chose, you know what? I'm just, I don't even want to do anything else for God the rest of my life. I'm just burnt out. Every time I try to do something for God, a trial, a tribulation, a problem comes, I'm done. You know what causes that? It's not just like, oh, you're going along and everything's great, and then you just decide to just stop. That, that's, that doesn't happen. No, you hit a bump in the road. Something causes you to mourn. Something causes you to be sad, to be discouraged. And you know what? You either make the choice to be exercised thereby to make straight paths for your feet, or you let that which is lame be turned out of the way. And you know what? So that's why God said to Samuel, I wonder how long Samuel would have continued. Here, I can guarantee you this, it would have went on longer than when God intervened. Because that's the whole point why God came, was to tell him, how long wilt thou mourn? Right? So what, what is this passage actually teaching? You know, there's a, It's not joyous when you're going through trials and tribulations, grievous. You know, It's grievous. There's pain, there's punishment, right? When God is punishing you, it's not fun, right? But it's, it's teaching this, don't give up. That's, that is the point of this passage. When God punishes you, don't just give up. Don't just be discouraged. Don't just, you know, that, that applies to every area of life. Was Samuel uh, responsible for what happened with Saul? No, right? But God still said the same thing. How long will thou mourn? Don't just give up. Don't you, you know what? It's time to move on. That's why he's saying make straight. This is what this is teaching. When something bad happens, seek resolution, right? <clears throat> seek resolution. <clears throat> I think I have it here. First Samuel chapter number 16, verse number 1, so you don't have to turn back. <clears throat> the Bible says this. And Lord, the Lord said unto Samuel, watch what he says. How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? And then he says this. Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, 
For I have provided me a king among his sons. So in that same exact verse, what does he say? He says, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, right? And then he tells him, he goes in with the positive. You know what he's doing? He's saying, hey, I have a resolution. Stop just, he didn't just say, hey, just stop being sad and just stay where you're at, did he? He didn't just say, just stop mourning and then the verse ended. No, he's saying, not only stop mourning, but move on. I have someone else. Saul is in the past. I have, I'm, he's going to be replaced by David. That's what, the, that's what this is actually teaching when, he's, when he comes in. How long will thou mourn? He says, fill thine horn with oil. It's meant to tell him, hey, it's not over. Amen. There's a resolution. We're going to fix this problem. And that's a major point. When, when something bad happens in your life, you need to get to the point where you automatically, when something bad goes wrong, you don't just put your head down. You don't just, you know, there's nothing wrong with mourning during that period of time, but you should be mourning like them with like those which have no hope. There's different types of mourning. You shouldn't be mourning and sad like it's just the end of the world. There's nothing I can do. Even during that time, you can seek resolution. You can continue mourning during a period of time and and, and drawing that out to the point of not farther than it should be, but you know, riding that out to the end of when it really you know you start to feel better. But you should always be ready to seek resolution. You should never be just giving up. You should be saying, okay. We have a problem. Something bad happened in my life. Something bad happened to me. Now I need to fix it. That should be the state of mind. Amen. And that's what God says. Fill thine. What does what oil represent in the Bible all the time? A blessing. He's saying, hey, I rejected Saul. And then the very next thing is fill thine horn with oil. It's not over. It's time to move on. And he says, I, I, and he says in 1 Timothy 16, right after that, he says, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Watch what he says, how God words it. It's meant to be encouraging. He says, for I have provided me a king among his sons. He said, I have a king. I provided myself a king among his sons. It's meant to be an encouragement. Because what is wrong with Samuel right now? He thinks, oh, it's all over. Israel, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, we're done. He's like, it's not over. Fill your horn with oil. Don't give up. I've provided me a king. It's time to move on and stop mourning for Saul. And it's time to start worrying about David. It's time to forget about him. That's the point of that passage is that how long will you mourn? Forget about it and then move on. Amen. Move on from that. Turn to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 15, 7 is very similar. I didn't, I didn't look it up, but Hebrews 12, where we were at, was actually, is actually quoting, I believe, in Isaiah of the Old Testament. I didn't look it up. I don't remember where it's at. But uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 7 is speaking to Asa. It's a very similar statement. He says, Be ye strong, therefore, watch what he says, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. He gives them the encouraging word. Don't be weak. Don't let your hands be weak. He says, Be strong, right? For your work shall be rewarded. You guys are in Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 14. The context was, he began in Philippians chapter number 3. He starts talking about how, you know, to beware of the Jews... And that's what he's talking about. You know, the Zionists would reject that, but that's clearly what he's talking about. And then he says, you know, he explains, we are the circumcision. And then he goes on to talk about how he's physically of the circumcision. And he kind of gives all of his accolades, all the reasons why he was like great among those that were the Jews, physically. And then he says, but I've rejected all that, right? And then verse 14, we're going to pick up. I press toward the mark for the prize. Actually, let's let's go back a little bit farther. I want to begin reading in verse number. We'll start verse number nine. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I also, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. 
Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Watch what he says. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So notice, if we would have read there in all those passages where he mentions his accolades, where he mentions all of the things that he could use, and here's the thing, they're not truly accolades. That's the point of the passage. He's saying like, hey, I was a Jew physically, and I excelled more than the, those that are the physical Jews and that embraced Judaism more than basically all of them did. That's his point. But then he's saying basically, this is his point. I rejected that for the true religion. Now think about this. Paul mentions all of these accolades for a false, that he had for a false religion. If you were a Buddhist, okay, and you were like, you excel to like the top of, I don't even know how that works or what it would be, but like the top of Buddhism, okay? And you're like this teacher, this grand master of Buddhism, right? Think about this. Would that be a good thing once you found out about the true religion, all that stuff you had in the past? No. If, just a little nugget here too, I just thought about, I want to make another point. If Judaism, you know how people call it Judeo-Christian, right? Religion. If Judaism was the same as Christianity, then that all that stuff would would have been good. You understand? He could have just kind of just taken it over. But that's why he explains, I counted all that. Judaism, I counted it, but dumb. It's not a part of Christianity. All the things that he did as a Jew, it's dumb. Right. That's what he says right there. But that wasn't my point. So he's saying right here, it was a false religion, and that's the, the statements that he makes. I counted it, but dumb. Now I want you to think about what he says for a minute. He's saying his entire life. I don't know how old he is here, 25, 30, maybe 40. He's saying my entire life was dumb. It was a waste. Isn't that kind of depressing? Like you have wasted 30 years of your life. And now I finally found out, and he was truly deceived. He says that in Galatians. I believe it's Galatians. No, it's in 2 Timothy. It's in either 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy, I think 2 Timothy. But he says, he says, like, that he was truly deceived. Okay? Wouldn't that be a time where that could be pretty depressing? Couldn't he have just said, hey, you know, now I found out the true religion. You know, I got saved. But he's like, but I just wasted my life. It just been, he just could have continued more. The rest of his life, of just how I wasted 35, 40 years, 25 years of his life. That is, that is depressing. You know what? There's nothing wrong with being sad that, hey... I, was, I grew up in a false religion my entire life. I was worshiping, you know, basically the devil my entire life, literally. And I was deceived, and all my family are all going to hell. And he's sad about that oftentimes. You see that in Romans 9. He talks about it multiple times. That he wishes he would be accursed for his kindred according to the flesh. That obviously was sad to him. It was depressing. You know what? Paul could have just given up. But what did he say? He said, I'm just forgetting those things which are behind me. I guarantee there was a time, because he goes, and there is a time period when he's blind, and he goes, and he goes to the street, which is called straight, right? And he seeks out Ananias, and what does he do during that time? I'm sure there was some mourning. I'm sure he was sad, right? I'm sure that, you know, he, he, had, he was thinking, like, I, you know, what have I been doing my entire life? I'm sure thoughts of through his, were running through his mind during that time massively. Just like during that period of time where he's just blind, he's just reflecting on himself, on his life, what had happened, all the people that he's thinking about that he loves. Like, we were really, we were persecuting the true God of the Old Testament the entire time. That is Jehovah. We were, we were cursing him and, and killing his followers. And I thought I was doing right. I'm sure he thought about that. But you know what? There was a time when, I believe it was Ananias, when he, when he told him to rise up. Right? It's time to get baptized. He told him, it's time to call upon the name of the Lord. Right? There was a time for that all to be done and over with. There's a time to mourn. That's, and then look at, look at verse number 13. <coughs> Brethren, I count not myself <coughs> to have apprehended but this one thing I do. He's saying, I haven't made it yet, but I will tell you what I do. He says, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He's not just sitting there dwelling on his past 
and mourning and sad and depressed. You know, just all the time that I wasted. He said, I'm just going to forget about all that. And I'm just going to turn and I'm going to look forward. I'm only going to worry about the rest of my life, right? He says, reaching forth unto those things which are before. And he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What's the point? Yeah, if you had a lot of bad things in your past like he did, if you've done a lot of bad things, if you had a lot of baggage... Just forget about it. If you have problems, if you have something going on in your life right now, it's okay, mourn. But make sure you keep that verse in your mind. How long wilt thou mourn? You're not going to mourn forever. You shouldn't mourn forever. You will destroy and ruin your life. If you just dwell on problems, maybe bad decisions that you yourself have made, forget about it. Stop being sad about it. There's a time to move on. Right. Let your sorrow be turned into joy. You know, you need to just move on from it. Yeah, life is not roses and rainbows. It's not perfect. And just face that right now. You need to settle that. Because a lot of people, it really doesn't hit with them. Bad things are going to happen to you. Really bad things. I don't know what it's going to be. And I'm not trying to curse your thoughts and curse your mind. But you're going to have family members die. You're going to have horrific things happen to you. Really bad. You know? You're going to have very bad things happen in your life. Very bad. Just tragic events that bring panic, that bring severe sorrow. That will happen. Life is sad. Life is not perfect. But if you go into life thinking everything's going to work out great all the time, you will fail in life. You will. How long will thou mourn? But if you go in like, hey, I know I'm going to have trouble in life. I know there's going to be problems. I know I'm going to have friends forsake me. I'm going to have family members that hate me. I'm going to have all kinds of issues, family members that die. If you already know, hey, when that happens, I'm not going to mourn forever. There's nothing wrong with being sad, but I'm going to to make sure that I have in my mind that I'm going to move on. You forget those things which are behind, and you move forward. Amen. You move forward and you continue the Christian race. You continue in the Christian life. You don't just dwell upon your problems. How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel? And then what, is he, what does he tell him? Fill your horn with oil. He's saying, I have something specifically for you to go do. I have something specific for you. And what does that <coughs> represent? A blessing. That's what oil represents in the Bible. I want you to turn to another passage. Go to, um, this will be the last place we'll go. Go to uh, Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 4. This concept also I turned before reading it. But in Hebrews chapter number 1, talking about having problems and just setting them aside or forgetting them. Hebrews chapter number 12, where we were reading in verse number 1, it says this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And then he says, and the sin, so something specific there, sin, which doth so easily beset us, saying it throws you off the path. And path. And then he says this, and let us run with patience. That's talking about enduring the race that is set before us. You need to lay things like that aside. So if you look in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 4. We'll read Matthew chapter number 5 because it's towards the beginning of the chapter. We'll begin reading verse number 1. It's a sermon on the mount, very famous, Jesus preaching. And he says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. It's known as the Beatitudes. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. I want you to notice, is the mourning going to continue? No, there's going to be a time where you're comforted. Amen. There's going to be a time when the mourning should end. There's going to be a time when it's, it's, you need to get over it. You understand? Don't continue being sad. and don't, you know, it's, it's fine to just be sad when something bad happens. That's fine. But you need to seek resolution during that time. You need to be thinking, well, how can we fix this? You know, it's sad, you know, but... What can we do? How can I move on from this? How can I, you know, get over this? And there's a time when you need to just forget and stop thinking about bad things that have happened in the past and the way your life was, and it's never going to be the same. You need to just get over it. Right. You're just going to think about that the rest of your life? 
You will ruin your life. That's what you'll do. Think about it. You will destroy your life if you just dwell upon the things of the past. You know what? I'm glad. I'm, I'm sure uh, Samuel's glad God came to him and said, how long was that one? Because once he got there and anointed Je- uh, David, son of Jesse, do you think he felt better or worse? Better. But you know what? You're hurting yourself when you just... Because that's how the d- depression works. It really does. You, like, feed off of yourself. Like, you're never... I'm never going to get over this. I'm never... Yeah, because you keep saying, I'm never going to get over this. That's why. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's how that continues. This is never going to be fixed. There's nothing we can do. But guess what? Even while you're sad, if you started telling yourself, everything's going to be okay. This is going to be gone. I need to try to look at the situation and get something positive out of it. I need to use this tribulation and, 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 and glory in tribulations, like it says in Romans chapter 5, and know, knowing that tribulation works in patience, and patience, experience, and experience hope. It yields. It yields. That's what this. It's teaching the same thing. Those two passages. It yields. You know, the fruit of righteousness. It's a, even trials and tribulations. You can use them, and it can it can bring about something positive in your life. And you can get something positive out of it. But if you just sit there and just eat yourself up inwardly, repeatedly, you know, this is never going to end. This is horrible. This is the worst thing. But that's what people think in their mind, like. No one has ever went through something so bad like this. I tell everybody to you. Everybody thinks that, that way to themselves. I don't think that life is, and you've said that to yourself a million times probably throughout your life, it can't get any worse than this. Yeah. You know? But you need to just get over it. You need to just move on at some point. Amen. How long wilt thou mourn? And you know what? Every sermon that I preach is not going to be like, you know, Everybody's amening, everybody's exciting, but you know what? A lot of the times the sermons that are preached that aren't like that are going to be the sermons that you can use in your life. The Bible teaching that you can use in your life, and it's even more impacting in your life, really. Amen. Seriously. If you're paying attention, you're thinking, and you're learning, and you see what the Bible actually teaches, these are things that are very important, important to your life. Because you will, I promise you, you will go through trouble, you will go through tribulation. You will be depressed and sad. But if you know at that time, like, hey, you know, I'm not going to do this forever. I'm not going to allow myself to just slump into this and just be sad and just continue dwelling on this the rest of my life. Once this is over, I'm going to mourn during this period of time, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. I'm going to go and fill my horn with oil. You know, I'm going to move on from that. I'm not going to just continue mourning. That's what you need to keep in your mind. How long? It's a rhetorical question. He's saying, enough, Samuel, enough is enough. It's went on long enough. He, he obviously was mourning. It wasn't a day. You know, he didn't start mourning that. You know, it, it wasn't sad just at 7 o'clock and then God comes to him at 12. Like, how long will that mourn? Yeah. You know, like three hours later. It was probably weeks. I don't know how long it was. Uh, you know, maybe nine, ten days. That was a tragic event. I mean, Samuel was the prophet and Saul was the king of all of Israel. And that, and he had won. He was victorious. Samuel met Saul when he was younger. You understand what I'm saying? And, and it was. A, I'm sure Samuel was excited. Like Saul's going to do great things. But guess what? It didn't work out that way. That's why he's so upset in the first place. If it wasn't a big deal, it wouldn't be that sad. But he told him, you know what? Even big events. How long wilt thou mourn? There's a time to be sad. You know what? Let that sorrow be turned into joy. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this day, dear Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the comfort and just those comforting words that, that you spoke uh, in the Beatitudes, uh, in the Sermon of the Mount, dear Lord, that those that mourn, that they, they will be, they that, that mourn will be comforted. We thank you, dear Lord, for all the promises. We thank you for the comforter, for the Holy Spirit. We ask you, dear Lord, just to bless us and be with us, uh, keep us safe, and uh, just continue to bless the church. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.